Welcome everyone to this briefing on clinical advances in focused ultrasound, where we'll be spotlighting key results presented here at the Fifth International Symposium on Focused Ultrasound. I'm Jessica Foley, the Chief Scientific Officer for the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us, uh, those of you that are here in person as well as those online. I'm gonna start with a brief introduction on focused ultrasound just to give you a bit of an overview and then also to um, kind of update you high level on some progress that's been made in the past few years since our previous symposium. And then I'll pass it along to all of our clinical speakers who will give you more in-depth overview of some exciting advances. So to start out with, the principle of focused ultrasound is pretty straightforward. Very similar to how a magnifying glass would focus rays of sun on a small point on a leaf to burn a hole. In the case of focused ultrasound, you have multiple intersecting beams of ultrasound that could be targeted from outside of the body and applied to a region deep in the body, such as a tumor or an area of diseased tissue. And what you'll get at these focal point where all of the beams converge is a profound therapeutic effect there are many different effects that could occur there. But the important thing is that everywhere else, all of the intervening tissue or the, the tissue that's adjacent to that focal point, you'll have, you'll have no uh, biological effect. So this will be uh, untreated tissue. Focused ultrasound is really a platform technology that has the capability of treating many different clinical disorders. And it does this by more than 18 different biomechanisms that can occur at that small focal point. And with these variety of effects, it enables the treatment of a variety of disorders. And you'll hear about things today that are treating neurological disorders, as well as various cancers, and then even many other types of applications. So I'll just highlight a few primary mechanisms that you'll hear about today, um, but there are many other ones. The, the first is, is tissue ablation, and that's probably the most, most used. So it's a way of using thermal energy uh, or the ultrasound will create a, a thermal destruction of tissue right at that focal point. Um, you could also uh, destru destroy the tissue using a non-thermal mechanism of focused ultrasound as well. And another exciting one is drug delivery. So focused ultrasound could be used to enhance drug delivery um, through the blood-brain barrier or through other membranes, and also can be used to help um, enable localized drug delivery uh, avoiding uh, more systemic delivery and avoiding the toxicities that come with that. And then finally, another exciting mechanism you'll hear about is using focused ultrasound to induce an immune response or to help enhance the effects of immunotherapeutics. And as I mentioned, all these many different disorders that can be treated, <clears throat> here is a, um, a graph showing you just the current state of the field today, and so you can see many different types of of applications that are, that are being investigated for treatment using focused ultrasound. It's important to note that many of these are still very early stage, but there are several now that are in clinical trials and several that have been approved outside of the U.S. and here in the U.S. And I just want to spotlight the four that have been approved by the FDA. They're for the treatment of uterine fibroids, pain from bone metastases, and then recent approvals for uh, prostate tissue ablation and essential tremor. And so since, the, since we last met two years ago at our previous symposium, there's really been a lot of progress, and I'd say that the rate of progress is accelerating. So what I have here are just a few headlines of exciting things, and you'll hear about most of these in more detail today. Just start by mentioning the couple of new FDA approvals that happened late last year. Two different companies with two different um, devices got approval for treating prostate tissue, and so that kind of uh, leads us towards treating prostate cancers. Um, and then most recently, you'll, you'll hear about in the next talk, the FDA approved a system for treating essential tremor, and this is the first application approved for focused ultrasound treatment in the brain, which is incredibly exciting. You'll also hear about uh, the, the capability of focused ultrasound to uh, temporarily um, breach the blood-brain barrier to enable delivery of drugs that ordinarily wouldn't be able to get into the brain. And that has had, we've had a patient treated for that as well. And so you'll, you'll hear about a lot of these exciting developments today. And then finally, we've also done a great job of raising awareness 
for the technology. Um, most notably is a small or uh, short book that John Grisham wrote called The Tumor, and this has helped raise a tremendous amount of awareness with more than 500,000 copies that have been dis distributed of this free book. And so that's been pretty remarkable. And then the partnerships that have been formed um, between our Focused Ultrasound Foundation and other like-minded foundations have led to, again, a lot of awareness and expanding the research into to new communities beyond our typical Focused Ultrasound community. And I just want to highlight one, a partnership with the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Um, our chairman of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, Dr. Neil Cassell, was selected by the vice president as one of 28 members of a National Cancer Institute Blue Ribbon panel to advise the cancer moonshot. And so that's been really great for uh, visibility and awareness. And now we'll move into talking about the, uh, the clinical application. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Jeff Elias. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Jeff Elias, and I'm going to talk about uh, the, t the technology and some of the uh, key clinical applications uh, for this in, in uh, the area of movement disorders. And I think before, um, I think before we get into the, each of the clinical indications, I want to just say a few, few words about the technology. Um, this is an, an MRI-guided focused ultrasound system, so it really represents two technologies. Uh, we're using the diagnostic capability of MRI and then the therapeutic capability of uh, focused ultrasound. And in the uh, upper panel on the left, you can see that the uh, focused ultrasound transducer is shaped like a helmet. It's MRI compatible, so the patient can be placed into the uh, transducer, and then the whole treatment takes place within the MR. And there are a lot of advantages to this. Uh, one of the, the primary advantages is the ability to monitor the treatment uh, with the MRI. So <coughs> MRI is capable of detecting temperature changes in the brain to within one degree Celsius. So we're able to monitor very carefully the treatment while it's being delivered. And there are very few uh, surgical procedures where we're able to actually watch a treatment that's going on deep inside of the body. So I think that's a key uh, 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 feature of this technology. And in the upper right, you can see deep inside the brain, there's a, a small thalamic ablation. That's a type of treatment we would do to treat a tremor problem. And here you can see with the spiral drawings uh, from a patient with essential tremor, uh, the, the type of tremor you'd see before the treatment and then after a focused ultrasound thalamotomy treatment. So this technology really lends itself to very careful monitoring of the treatment. We can monitor the patient with imaging and with clinical testing. So we're very pleased uh, to, to release our results from this uh, international randomized controlled trial this week at the, at the Focus Ultrasound Sym Symposium. This was a trial that uh, investigated uh, the effects of focused ultrasound for a problem called essential tremor. That's a very common movement disorder problem. It's in fact the most common uh, movement disorder condition that affects people. Um, and we enrolled patients with moderate to severe tremors. These are patients that are kind of losing the ability to use their hands, uh, and uh, they're refractory to medical treatments. Uh, so they, they sought uh, uh, tremor control and improvement in their functional aspects in day-to-day -day life. And uh, this was a very rigorous clinical trial where there were sham procedures performed, and then the uh, patients could cross over and have the treatment. So all... Um, uh, the, the, the trial clearly demonstrated a, a very positive effect with focused ultrasound in suppressing tremor. Um, and there were some adverse events, as we expect, with every surgical procedure. These are the types of uh, adverse effects that you would see with a normal thalamotomy procedure. So we performed a focused ultrasound thalamotomy uh, through the closed skull without any incision or, or hole uh, being made. And most importantly, um, patients uh, had uh, nearly 40, 49 to 50% tremor suppression overall, and that uh, led to substantial improvements in their disability uh, scores and quality of life. So you can see some of the different activities uh, that we use for these ratings. All of them dramatically improved after focused ultrasound thalamotomy. Even some of the 
uh, non-physical components like social activities or psychosocial elements uh, had dramatic improvements if we were able to control uh, the tremor in the hands. And, I, and as Jessica mentioned, this led to an FDA approval last month uh, as really the first uh, indication for a brain intervention with this technology. Um, I think it's really uh, just the tip of the iceberg for what could be uh, possible with this technology, and we're, we're really proud that the, the trial led to this approval. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk about another clinical indication. This is Parkinson's tremor. This particular uh, subtype of Parkinson's disease or this flavor of symptoms is very similar to essential tremor. I think it's kind of a natural next step after this, the, uh, the studies in essential tremor. So these patients uh, often have some of the same limitations or disabilities that you could get with essential trim with a severe essential tremor. And so we, we have uh, just completed uh, a clinical trial in 27 patients with Parkinson's tremor. These are tremors that are severe. They're refractory to all of the latest medical therapies. Uh, and the, the study design was very similar to the essential tremor in that it was a randomized controlled trial. Patients were carefully monitored and assessed by videotape ratings uh, from, from doctors who were not involved in the procedures. And, and this trial also showed a very clear benefit from focused ultrasound uh, when compared to the control group or those that had a sham procedure. And so that, I think, uh, gives us a lot more enthusiasm to, um, you know, continue this line of investigation in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is very um, multifactorial, mono, or multiple, uh, involves multiple symptom complexes. So this is a different symptom with Parkinson's disease, dyskinesia. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effect of chronic uh, levodopa uh, usage. And uh, it, it involves a different type of focused ultrasound treatment, but nevertheless could be very potentially very uh, important to control the dyskinesias associated with Parkinson's disease. So there's currently a, uh, an, another ongoing multi-center trial going on around the world. Um, this is a single arm open label study and there's 40 patients are intended to be treated and 17 have been treated to date. So we anticipate that this trial hopefully should finish within the year or so uh, as a as second trial in Parkinson's disease. And lastly, I'll just make a few comments about a new trial that we have to, uh, that we're, we've just begun uh, to open. This is a trial uh, that's going to investigate epilepsy, or more specifically, subcortical epilepsy. What I mean by subcortical is uh, an epilepsy that comes from a deeper area of the brain. A lot of epilepsies come from the surface of the brain. Uh, this particular trial is looking at epilepsies that uh, originate from problems that affect uh, deeper regions of the brain. And so uh, 15 patients are scheduled to be uh, enrolled and treated. These are patients that are refractory to medical therapy. They have severe seizures that don't respond to medications. Uh, and then they'll be treated with focused ultrasound and monitored uh, for one year time. So this is a new trial that's just uh, received FDA approval under an IDE application and will open uh, uh, and, is, and is open now. So uh, that's what I have to say about movement disorders, and I, I'll shift the uh, podium to Dr. Fishman. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I get the fun of telling you about some of the future applications of FUS, particularly in improving delivery of therapeutics to the brain. And that's traditionally been a, a real obstacle for all forms of drug therapy because of the fact that there's specialized lining in brain blood vessels called the blood-brain barrier. And uh, for the last 40 years, there have been very primitive techniques to try to open it, but it can be opened with actually relatively low amounts of power, as you see in this animation from the Columbia group, to uh, essentially put microbubbles that are commonly used uh, as contrast agents when you, if you've ever had an echocardiogram, uh, if you get an injection, that's what you're being injected with so that you get better pictures. But when uh, more intense ultrasound hits these microbubbles, they vibrate very violently, and some of them even explode. And that force pops open 
the specialized lining, all of the uh, lining cells normally in the brain, they're all linked together. And when that area of targeted uh, focused ultrasound hits that area, they really pop open. And there's been more than a decade of work by uh, half a dozen excellent groups that have really modified this procedure so it can be done in a controlled way and in a safe way to keep uh, injurious products like blood escaping from uh, these, uh, these, uh, these pores or keep them from actually damaging the blood vessels. Because sadly, uh, let's see, uh, the technology, there's been a huge explosion in the world of cellular and molecular biology and developing therapeutics. We have genetically engineered proteins. We have genetically engineered antibodies. We have gene therapy. We have engineered therapeutic cells. And even in clinical trials to date, the standard procedure is really a variation of the hypodermic needle. Uh, they need to be surgically implanted into brain, injected in, again, slightly more sophisticated manner uh, than what could have been done 100 years ago. And the bigger the therapy, and the biggest being cells, the poor, more poorly they spread throughout the brain. And this is a picture of a blob of cells that have been injected into a monkey. And even a month later, uh, these are cells that were intended to treat Parkinson's disease. They remain kind of as a blob within the brain along the needle tract. Uh, and so again, we're looking to focus ultrasound as both a safer and more effective way of spreading these larger forms of therapeutic molecules. These, the proteins are on the order of a thousand times greater than a typical drug. A cell is more than a million times greater than a typical drug. And uh, in animal models, and this is pivotal work uh, from the group at, uh, at Harvard, uh, led by uh, Nathan McDonald, and showing that in combination with an enzyme-directed immune therapy directed against the tumor in combination with focused ultrasound that you actually get uh, tumor regression. So the lines going up are showing that uh, untreated and uh, the anti by itself, ultrasound by itself, with these low amounts of energy, the tumors continue to grow. But by allowing a blood-brain barrier opening in the area of the tumor, the antibodies are able to penetrate into the tissue and, and do what they're supposed to do which is uh, killing, uh, in this case, metastatic breast cancer cells. There have already been clinical trials of growth factors to try to improve Parkinson's disease. Uh, and they've been marginally successful. Again, they use uh, direct injection of gene therapy or protein therapy directly into the brain. Uh, with focused <coughs> ultrasound in animal models, uh, within the last year, there have been uh, in a situation where you treat an animal with a, a drug that kills the cells that are uh, usually dying in Parkinson's disease. Again, normal is that upper panel on the left. Uh, you kill off all the cells and you get the middle panel. But if you deliver this growth factor, uh, glial-derived growth factor, GDNF, which has already been in clinical trials in Parkinson's disease, uh, not by injecting it into brain, but by using microbubbles and gene therapy, you actually get some degree of restoration. So again, this is beginning pioneering work, but we're looking forward to growth factor therapy and gene therapy uh, for Parkinson's disease in this minimally invasive fashion. Uh, Another technology that is exploding is the use of nanoparticles. You can really attach pretty any therapeutic you want to. And the uh, UVA group, in collaboration with the Hopkins group, have developed nanoparticles that after they cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, penetrate uh, the kind of gelatinous scaffold that holds brain cells together. Uh, they penetrate into brain. And in this example, and again, in an animal model, uh, they continue to make their gene product, in this case an enzyme, uh, the same enzyme that's in fireflies, uh, and you see a light signal that persists for a month from a single treatment. So again, another technique to deliver important therapeutics to brain using focused ultrasound. <laughs> uh, 
as I mentioned, uh, there really is a barrier within brain. Uh, so the space between the cells uh, is not purely liquid, it's kind of a gelatin. And, and that's also what limits even direct brain injection. But focused ultrasound can not only open up the blood-brain barrier, but it can take, in this case, uh, particles or genes, or in this case, viruses, uh, and agitate them and actually increase their spread through tissue so that uh, on the left, uh, that's a, an injection without focused ultrasound. On the right, and represented by the bar graph on, on the lower right, there's much more extensive spread of the therapeutic throughout brain from a single brain injection. So not just by injections into the blood and crossing the blood-brain barrier, but even enhancing movement of therapeutics within brain. And one of the reasons, it's been a sad commentary uh, on this work that many promising therapies that seem to work in small animals like rodents uh, don't work anywhere near w as well in a large human brain. And so having something that spreads the therapeutic more effectively through brain can be a real advance to therapy. One other, uh, again, through relatively unknown processes, but if one opens the blood-brain barrier in an animal model of Alzheimer's disease, and this slide is courtesy of the group in Australia who's published this in science, uh, one can reduce and clear the abnormal protein of Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid protein, the major target of all of 90% of therapy directed at Alzheimer's disease. Uh, treating that area with focused ultrasound improves the clearance. Uh, the lower slide is again a sham, and you'll see in the area on top, the, the, the cortex, you'll see dark blobs. And that dark blob along the, uh, among the white is an, al is an amyloid plaque, the toxic protein in Alzheimer's disease. And again, through mechanisms that aren't totally clear, it may be through our normal immune system that treating and moving the spot of uh, focused ultrasound throughout the brain uh, helps clear it. It turns out that in humans, we actually have scans that can detect amyloid. And these will be very useful as we move forward relatively soon into pilot clinical trials in patients with Alzheimer's disease and see if focused ultrasounds can start to clear amyloid out of the, the affected human brain. Well, the biggest of all of the therapies are actually cells. And uh, the work of the Toronto group demonstrated several years ago that even these very large uh, therapies with focused ultrasound uh, can be introduced into brain uh, if you open the blood-brain barrier safely. Uh, like all therapies put into the blood, part of the issue is getting enough in to be clinically effective. And so at the University of Maryland, we've actually uh, taken a complementary technology that's also minimally invasive called magnetic attraction or magnetic targeting to try to improve that delivery. <coughs> okay. And in this situation, we use nanoparticles. And we, it turns out that the cells will engulf nanoparticles as we grow them in a dish and we can fill them up with two types of nanoparticles. Nanoparticles that aren't uh, iron-containing, are non-magnetic, uh, in the case of the red bar, are nanoparticles that are filled with uh, iron-containing substance and actually can be attracted to an external magnet. And uh, talk about non-invasive. So after the blood-brain barrier is open, the cells are injected by vein into the animal, uh, and the animal is kept under anesthesia, and the head just rests on what is basically a very large refrigerator magnet. Uh, and that has enough force that we can increase the number of cells that enter brain in that right bar graph about tenfold. So there are ten times as many magnetic cells as there are non-magnetic cells. And so these are the types of things, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see delivery of uh, techniques catch up to the enormous progress there's been in developing these therapies for human disease. And did I go?
Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to the discussion of focused ultrasound for the treatment of cancer. I'm uh, Ju Ha Huang from the University of Washington. Uh, and in the next 10 minutes, I'll basically give an overview of the current uh, status uh, of focused ultrasound for the treatment of cancer. It's a huge topic, uh, but I'll try and kind of pinpoint uh, some key areas. Uh, Dr. Elias has already, um, I, I'm going to give an overview based on this uh, four pillars graphic that the Focused Ultrasound Foundation has come up with that really does an excellent job in terms of highlighting the potential benefits for cancer treatment using focused ultrasound. Um, many of these concepts have actually already be, been discussed by Dr. Elias and Dr. Fishman. Uh, for example, uh, the concept of using ablation. Uh, for neurologic treatments, it's usually a very small focus that is ablated. We take that concept in oncology and we treat a much larger volume. Uh, but basically, the concept is to replace invasive ser uh, therapy. So this is non-invasive. Uh, we're able to destroy tissue typically through thermal mechanisms, but we're also exploring uh, mechanical mechanisms by something called histotripsy, where we can completely destroy tissue uh, uh, quite rapidly without any cutting or scarring. Uh, the theory is that this will be uh, less painful and require a short, shorter recovery time for patients, uh, reduce the risk of infection, and certainly the goal would be to reduce the total cost of care, so going towards a more cost-effective therapy. Uh, it also has the potential to replace or optimize radiation therapy. Again, there are many radiation therapies that try and achieve ablation. We can do this with non-ionizing radiation with ultrasound. We can also do this collaboratively with uh, the radiation oncologist because uh, the delivery of high-intensity high focused ultrasound or hyperthermia actually sensitizes tumors, making them more radiosensitive. So that this could be a collaborative uh, uh, venture, uh, pr making treatments safer and more effective, and again, trying to reduce the total cost of care. Uh, the uh, potential for using ultrasound for enhancing drug delivery was uh, discussed by Dr. Fishman, and this, the concepts with oncology are very similar. Uh, the thought is that a lot of these tumors uh, uh, are difficult to penetrate, either because of fibrous stroma or lack of vasculature. Uh, we can use ultrasound with or without contrast agents potentially with temperature-sensitive liposomes that are loaded with drug, uh, and use that to improve drug delivery to these tumors while reducing systemic toxicity. Uh, and one thing that um, is evolving and has been a, uh, an exciting area uh, in this conference has been the discussion of HIFU having the potential to enhance anti-tumor immune response uh, or delivery of immunotherapy, and this is one of the areas that the Cancer Moonshot Initiative actually identifies as a key area of interest, and HIFU is very well positioned to participate in that. Uh, and I, in, this, in this next slide, uh, I want to kind of emphasize or go over how this potentially could occur. In the upper left-hand corner, we have thermal ablation that occurs with uh, ultrasound, and by doing that, that often elicits uh, cellular antigens as well as uh, danger signals uh, from inflammation that can upregulate the immune system. Uh, if we were to just deliver mild hyperthermia, so treat to about 42 degrees C um, for a period of time, uh, the, the cells can stay intact, but it upregulates the heat shock proteins, which also uh, play a role in the immune response. And then um, newer methods at trying to actually mechanically disrupt cells in vivo by something called histotripsy that uses cavitation to disrupt whole cells. That ends up lysing cells and releases cancer-specific antigens. And the thought is that these antigens can then be presented to uh, basically immune cells, such as dendritic cells, and upregulate the immune response. So, there are many potential mechanisms that focused ultrasound can activate the immune, uh, immune uh, system, and there's a lot of research that's going on. What's exciting is that there are clinical examples of this that um, are, are driving this. This, uh, this is a slide from Dr. Orsi from uh, Italy, and on the left-hand side, you see a CT scan, and in the middle of that scan is a tumor. It's a pancreatic cancer. Uh, and in the second slide to the right of that, um, where the, the HIFU uh, cartoon points to, 
that is uh, following ablation. And what you see is um, it's a darker area because contrast has been administered and there's no contrast penetrating that, demonstrating that this, this particular tumor has been ablated. Uh, in the box below, there is um, uh, an image of uh, lymph nodes that are adjacent to the aorta. So these are metastatic sites of cancer that are enlarged. Uh, and um, what this is going to demonstrate is something called an abscopal effect, where we treat the tumor. These lymph nodes were not treated. Uh, but in the process of treating this, somehow the immune system got upregulated. And again, this is the, Im on the image on the left is the Im immediate post-treatment. You see the enlarged nodes. And then following that, you, you'll see the first images from September 2014, and then in April of 2016, you see that same area just to the right, there's no evidence of any lymph nodes. These lymph nodes were not treated by HIFU. So the only plausible mechanism for this is somehow the body's own immune response uh, decided to go in and attack the uh, metastasis to those lymph nodes, and those have since regressed. So, uh, there are many anecdotal cases. The question you know, we have is how can we control this? How can we uh, make this more effective and more reliable? Uh, and again, on the PET scan to the right, you see the tumor and there's no evidence of active disease there. So um, this, this shows this potential for this epscopal effect uh, where you treat one side, but it has a systemic effect. Uh, and so this, this is very exciting. Uh, pancreatic cancer, I think, is uh, a ripe target for high-intensity focused ultrasound because there are so few effective therapies. Uh, there's great potential in terms of both drug delivery, immune response, and ablation uh, that um, uh, we're very excited about this particular application. Uh, going on to um, something that's here and now is uh, prostate cancer. Uh, there are five companies that are developing focused ultrasound prostate devices. There's a large population of uh, men who have prostate cancer. More than 55,000 patients have been treated worldwide with <coughs> HIFU alone. Uh, there are two ultrasound image-guided transrectal devices that received FDA approval this past year, as uh, Jessica Foley mentioned earlier. Those are the Sonoblade 450, uh, made in the US, and the Ablotherm, uh, made in France. And in addition, uh, there is a phase one study that's recently been completed looking at treatment of localized uh, prostate cancer with a very unique transurethral device. It's an MR-guided system that goes through the urethra as opposed to transrectal called the Tulsa Pro. And I'll just discuss this very briefly. Um, this, again, it, the Tulsa uh, word comes from transurethral ultrasound ablation. Uh, this is an what, we, what they call an inside-out approach as opposed to the transrectal, which is more of an outside-in approach. Um, uh, there is a, a phase one study that was recently completed and published in the European Journal of Urology, uh, reporting on 30 prostate cancer patients that were treated at three centers where they attempted near whole gland ablation with a three millimeter safety margin. And since this was a pilot study, they did a, a greater safety margin than they're planning for their pivotal, uh, where they're trying to achieve a whole gland treatment. And they had very favorable safety profiles and very promising oncologic outcomes. However, uh, follow-up has been short, and so we still need to see outcomes from that. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is um, uh, the current status of um, uh, HIFU in oncology, with the exception of a couple indications, which my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Ganuni, is going to talk about next, uh, where he'll discuss bone metastasis and sarcoma. So this is the last slide. Um, Jessica Foley showed this earlier, uh, the current status of oncologic therapies. Uh, and with that, uh, I will pass the baton on to uh, Dr. Ganuni. Hello everyone, my name is Pejman Ganuni. I'm a radiologist at Stanford using focus ultrasound and I'll be talking about the treatment of benign and malignant uh, bone and soft tissue tumors using focus ultrasound. Uh, bone's a fantastic target for this technology. It takes advantage of all the physics of focus ultrasound. Uh, bone absorbs ultrasound very readily and so very little ultrasound energy results in high temperatures, it increases the safety margin and the effectiveness when we use it to target bone. 
In particular, there's level of unevidence, which I want to emphasize is a level of rigor that is not often seen in, uh, in new technologies and in uh, devices and so forth. When Dr. Elias talks about the level of evidence that's been uh, generated for a central tremor, or when we talk about bone metastases, it seems common sense that we would have this level, but it's, uh, it's actually unusual, that, uh, and it gives a level of confidence to the physicians when we talk to our patients and we can say that we know this works. So it, it shouldn't just uh, go without comment, the, the, the level of rigor that's been applied to this. In particular with metastases, uh, as our technologies have improved, our techniques have improved for treating, with, uh, treating patients with cancer, more and more patients are living longer with their cancers and eventually developing bone metastases. Uh, radiation is the common uh, treatment form for these patients that have painful metastases, but it works in maybe two-thirds of these patients, which leaves a large number of patients there that have an unmet need. Focus ultrasound's been used uh, and has been proven, as you can see in the graph there. there that's a placebo-controlled study uh, showing about a 64 percent response rate compared to a background rate of about 20 percent using MR-guided focus ultrasound to treat patients with painful metastases. This level of evidence led to FDA approval and now, importantly, insurance coverage. And this is a, a standard treatment that we now offer for our patients with uh, metastases. The uh, evidence that was uh, presented in, in that graph has been extended. Or should I point this, Jessica? There we go. More recently, and confirmed by Dr. Alberto Basocci in Bologna, over 130 treatments uh, have, have been performed there as a salvage after failed radiation, and also now as first-line therapy. As referring physicians have become more confident in the results, uh, you, you, we see more and more that the technology is being offered as uh, first-line therapy for these patients. It's less invasive. There's less toxicity to the tissues around uh, the treated tumor. In his case, he saw a 59% reduction in pain scores with a year of follow-up and durable results. He's now extended this beyond just pain management to looking at actual tumor control. And with 50 lesions treated and a three-month follow-up, he's able to show a 92 percent uh, tumor control. Very exciting results showing the possibility of this treatment, not just for pain, but for also tumor management. Benign bone tumors are also uh, being treated with focus ultrasound. Uh, in particular, osteoidosteoma is a painful tumor that occurs typically in young people in the long bones. Uh, originally, this was treated with surgery. Uh, a lot of morbidity, a recovery time was prolonged in the periods of months. Uh, more recently, radiofrequency ablation has taken over as a main approach, but that involves drilling into the bone and placing an electrode to burn the, the, uh, the nidus of the tumor. Uh, Dr. Alessandro Napoli in La Sapienza University in Rome has pioneered the use of MR-guided focus ultrasound to treat these tumors, and uh, his most recent data with 45 patients and three years of follow-up in those patients showing a very high 87 percent uh, response rate with complete relief after a single treatment where the treatment lasts a few minutes. It's a, it's a remarkable, non-invasive approach. Very effective. There's ongoing trials in North America seeking to replicate and re extend these uh, results. Uh, Dr. Sharma at Children's National here uh, in D.C. and also Dr. Temple in Toronto Sick Kids. And then uh, we also have been offering this at, at Stanford and UCSF as a, uh, as a clinical alternative. And you can see on the images here uh, the before and after in the, um, the shin of a young person in the tibia there. You can see the, the central uh, clear lucent spot there is the nidus of the tumor, all that uh, exuberant bone reaction around it, the inflammatory reaction that's occurred. And then you can see a three-year follow-up there. The bone is basically normalized after his quick treatment. Arthritis is another indication for which uh, we've been investigating the use of MR-guided focus ultrasound and um, in particular low back pain, which is an extremely common um, symptom that probably many of us have experienced. Facet joint arthritis is a source of back pain in about 10 to 15 percent of patients with low back pain. Dr. Dukes in Frankfurt has uh, been using this technology to, uh, to treat these patients in 40 patients. Um, uh, average age is 67 years, 80 percent of those patients have had a durable uh, pain relief with no adverse events. Dr. Scorcia in Barcelona has also replicated these results, and there's an ongoing trial here in the United States um, to um, assess this technology as well. And in, in, other than back pain, there's also, of course, knee and hip and other joints. Uh, OA uh, osteoarthritis affects a third of those over the age of 65. Many of them have significant movement limitation or uh, limitations in terms of their activities of daily living. The, ca the cost in the United States for things like knee replacement and, joint re and uh, hip joint replacement is in the billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars. And the lost work and productivity, of course, for every individual adds up to a, a lot, too. So we, uh, people in Japan, the Kochi University team, 
team, Dr. Namba and his team there, have been investigating the use of focused ultrasound to treat knee pain. And in the patients that they've treated, uh, they've seen a 73% decrease in pain scores. Again, no adverse events. Ongoing trials there in Kochi, as well as in the Rizzoli in Bologna, investigating the use of this technology for not just knee, but also hand and hip pain. A lot of potential there. Another area, I think, very exciting application for focused ultrasound is in the treatment of soft tissue tumors. Uh, again, this is an, an application where we're looking to meet an unmet need. Uh, in particular, we look at desmoid tumors as a model system here. And this is a, a tumor type where current therapies really don't work very well. Surgery, uh, after surgery, even with clean margins, there's about a 50% recurrence rate. Uh, and uh, radiation has its own side effects, not the least of which is the ri risk of uh, developing a secondary malignancy after the radiation. Often these tumors occur in younger patients, and so there's a desire to avoid radiation if possible. Um, the, the chemotherapy that you use is not necessarily that effective and, again, carries its own side effects. Uh, Dr. DeBratwer in Melbourne, Dr. Buckner at UCSF, again, Dr. Basocci and Dr. Napoli in Italy, and uh, we also at Stanford have been using this technology, among others, uh, recently the team at Medical College of Wisconsin as well, uh, to treat patients, 66 treatments thus far, with many with uh, several years of follow-up. And you can see some of the before and after pictures there that really, I think, emphasize the value of this approach. Uh, on the uh, lower left there, you can see the young man who has a tumor in the base of his palm there. Uh, and th he was offered basically a very morbid surgery. This tumor involved the ulnar nerve and the tendons involving his hand. So in order to excise it, uh, there would probably have been loss of function. Uh, it offered radiation as well, but again, not desirable in such a young man. And of course, systemic therapy for a local disease is not desirable either. A single treatment, and you can see uh, we've been following him now for 18 months. The tumor has basically disappeared. Uh, the young lady there on the right with the lower leg desmoid tumor, uh, previously resected, a large recurrence as you can see. Again, we were able to treat it and, and significantly debulk the tumor with uh, very few side effects. The same approach is now being extended by uh, the, the team at Children's National, not just to desmoid tumors, which are locally problematic but are not going to metastasize, to actual soft tissue sarcomas, which do have that metastatic potential. And they've been re recruiting and treating patients, children in this case, with relapsed or refractory um, um, soft tissue tumors, sarcomas, and have been treating them and now are extending it and applying some of the techniques that uh, Dr. Wang was talking about earlier and combining focused ultrasound with drug delivery to try and improve the uh, success and efficacy of the technology. So a very exciting time, and again, I think the, the main emphasis is that we're able to meet a need that's unmet with this very minimally invasive technology with, again, proving over and over again that it has uh, significant efficacy with very few side effects. I'm going to pass the baton on now. Dr. Gertner, talking about the use of this for hypertension. Thank you. At Kona Medical, we're developing a technology to uh, ablate renal nerves, which have been shown to um, lead to lower blood pressures in patients with um, resistant uh, hypertension. <clears throat> We've, uh, as far as the company status, uh, the system is solely developed to treat um, hypertension and these renal nerves. Uh, we've treated over 150 patients now. Uh, we had three pilot studies, uh, wave one, two, three. They've been presented uh, several times elsewhere. And uh, we are uh, ourselves developing uh, some, some level one evidence. Uh, we have a randomized sham controlled study uh, called wave four, um, which is about 80 patients. Uh, and uh, those data will be presented um, in the fall at the cardiology meetings. Uh, we've developed a commercial system as well in parallel, and uh, that will uh, we, we will start trials in the U.S. Uh, under an IDE from FDA uh, shortly. Same type of trial, um, randomized, sham controlled, uh, to uh, obtain level one evidence and ultimately FDA approval. Uh, we do have uh, we're just about uh, CE mark approved um, any day now uh, uh, for that. <clears throat> So why do, you, why do we want to treat the renal nerves uh, externally? Why do we want to bleed them externally? Uh, all the technologies that, uh, to date, um, other than ours, have uh, placed a catheter inside the uh, renal artery. Uh, this um, is a very focal treatment um, on the renal artery. The heat has to go through the wall, um, and so it da does damage to the wall by definition, and then uh, treats a few of the nerves on the outside. Only um, larger, only the larger renal artery can be um, uh, treated. Uh, um, the nerves in in the parenchyma of the kidney uh, can't be treated this way because the arteries are 
uh, uh, too small. That, that's, that is with radio frequency energy. With external energy, we can treat blood vessels down to a millimeter or two millimeters without any damage. Um, and the nerves travel on the renal artery all the way into the kidney. And so it's important to get um, nerves uh, into the parenchyma of the kidney. We can change the shape of the, um, the, uh, the cloud, if you will, of um, energy uh, with just a software change. Um, it's also uh, obviously non-invasive for the patient um, uh, when, when we apply our technology. Uh, so there's no groin hematomas, there's no um, arterial damage uh, from a catheter um, that's penetrating through the artery. And I think one of the major um, advantages that we're seeing now is that we're going to be able to retreat patients. So uh, it may be preferential, it may be uh, from the biological standpoint, it may be preferential to treat um, these uh, uh, these nerves in a in a fractionated with a fractionated method, uh, maybe similar to the way tumors are treated with radiation um, <clears throat> in the future, and our technology allows that. Whereas with a catheter that's very invasive, you wouldn't be able to do multiple uh, treatments. And <clears throat> we're just starting to retreat patients uh, as well now, <clears throat> and some of those patients have had a, a, a radio frequency catheter in the past. This is a little bit of a video of the technology. It's a self-contained system. It's really set up for the user, for the hospital. Um, it's a, it's going to have a, uh, the cost will be about the same as a diagnostic ultrasound machine. It's easily stored um, uh, out of the out of the shipping crate uh, into the um, uh, treatment room. It's about 30 minutes, and you can be treating a patient. Um, it doesn't require any special structural support like a, like a radiation machine would, it, and it doesn't require any special rooms. It can be done in any treatment room. We've treated patients in um, the hallway. We've treated patients in um, patient rooms, um, post-operative care units, uh, that type of thing, conference rooms. Uh, it's very easy to do the treatment. It just needs standard power. <clears throat> Uh, and, and a variety of doctors can also do this treatment. Um, I think I can train um, any doctor to do this treatment uh, if they're willing and motivated uh, in about um, an hour. And uh, after about five to 10 treatments, they could be facile. Again, they have to be motivated. <clears throat> I'll just run through this one more time here if I can. So uh, where are we? Uh, hypertension is probably one of the biggest needs in cardiovascular um, medicine today. Uh, it's the largest, it's the single largest um, uh, cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide. Uh, our, the basis for this is, you know, it's strongly rooted in, um, in research and a lot of uh, preclinical evaluation with about five years now of, of research into this. Um, and we also have, a, I think, a very rational progression of our clinical trials. We're expanding now into, into multiple treatments, as I said. <clears throat> and um, uh, we're also looking at uh, some of the um, market and reimbursement uh, requirements that there will be uh, for this technology. <clears throat> We're now open for questions. We have an online question from our web. This question is for Dr. Elias. How many total patients have been treated for essential tremor around the world with focused ultrasound? And then do you have a waiting list for treating essential tremor patients? Uh, th this last international clinical trial was the largest uh, uh, treatment effort with 76 patients. Uh, prior to that, in open label pilot studies, I would I would say it's around 30, 30 essential tremor patients. So probably towards towards 100 in the clinical trials. And now with an FDA approval, you know, clinic routine clinical practice will start. And I think all the centers are seeing patients that are that are interested in the. Um, uh, in the procedure, um, so yeah, patients are definitely coming coming to all of the centers to be treated. For Dr. Gertner, do patients who get your, the Kona treatment for hypertension then need to take less medications? Yeah, I think uh, some definitely uh, that is the case. Not all. Uh, I think the, you know, the, this, this 
uh, technology in terms of the in terms of the clinical application is really in the in the early phases. Right now, we're focused on patients that are highly resistant um, to medications, um, and at some point, uh, we'll be able to um, uh, uh, treat patients that are sort of more what we call moderate, um, and they may have uh, they may be able to eliminate some medications. I think the patients that are very resistant, um, we were able to. We, we, the goal would be to control their blood pressure and they're still taking the, uh, the medications uh, that, that they're on. So I think on average what we're seeing is there's a little bit of a decrease in medication some patients a lot more than others. Um, and But we're really in the early phases of determining uh, the medication, how the medication usage will change. <clears throat> Uh, relative to uh, the procedures that are currently in place, of which uh, I'm told by many have many side effects. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody in his brother over the years has always lined up to go to Johns Hopkins for certain issues relative to that, but other people are treating people as well. I'd like to know what, you know, so we can, when I run around with my friends, I can talk intelligently, maybe. Thank you. Um, excellent question. I, I think that, uh, that there are no real efficacious therapies that are without side effects. And so uh, high intensity focus ultrasound also is one of those. Although it's non-invasive or minimally invasive in this case, it clearly has some side effects, uh, both in terms of incontinence and in terms of uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, they, they compare favorably to other methods of uh, uh, of treating prostate cancer, and they're certainly much more favorable than uh, radical prostatectomy, much less invasive. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm a gastroenterologist and I'm not a, uh, a urologist, uh, but again, this is also a highly operator dependent procedure. We're still in early phases. It would be important if you're interested in this or have a friend interested in it to talk and get more information from specific uh, physicians who are performing this. Uh, to get their experience and, you know, just to listen to all the options. Uh, but it's certainly making progress and it, it is probably one of the least invasive options. I think the, the real question is how effective is this in terms of long-term control of disease? Uh, and then the other question also is, you know, who should be getting treated? Dr. Fishman. How, how does focus ultrasound help to treat the patients with Alzheimer's? I mean, I mean, I know how, how is it projected to help them? Would it will it cure Alzheimer's? Could it improve memory? Just slow the disease progression? Could you address that? Well, most of the above. Uh, the worsening of Alzheimer's disease is directly related to this continued accumulation of this abnormal protein amyloid, and. Uh, that is naturally uh, clear to some extent. It, and a lot of the clinical trials that are in progress use a vaccine against amyloid as a potential treatment for that. And that's making significant progress. This focused ultrasound, the opening of the blood-brain barrier, uh, has been used both with and without these amyloid vaccines. And the issue is the an antibodies, either one's normal antibodies or one given uh, commercially available uh, developed that are against amyloid, probably cross the blood-brain barrier, bind to the amyloid protein, and are then cleared by the normal immune response uh, of that, with the potential uh, of these therapies to not only uh, stabilize Alzheimer's, but there is potential to even improve it. And, and some of these targets, uh, again, there are certain brain areas that are very involved with memory. And uh, I hope to see those areas targeted with focus ultrasound in the future. Dr. Ganuni, you talked about focus ultrasound used for soft tissue t tumors and for benign bone tumors. What about cancerous bone tumors, um, like something like Ewing sarcoma that's very serious? Um, 
So at this stage for malignancies, for cancers of the bone, for the, prim for the primary cancers, uh, it's at a clinical trial stage. So for example, the uh, case, I, the example I talked about from Children's National Medical Center in the United States. Outside the United States, there has been some use of HIFU for uh, primary sarcomas of the bone um, and some experience primarily out of, uh, out of China um, using the technology there with uh, reported effic uh, efficacy. Uh, here, the standard remains uh, surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. Um, but the initial clinical trial I was describing is investigating its use for the uh, patient that's had a recurrence or that's uh, the tumor that's refractory to current standard therapies to try and use focus ultrasound for that. We also have a trial in, at Stanford using uh, the technology as pr prior to surgery as part of a treat and resect model where we can gain some confidence in our ability to um, treat the tumor and, and see what the pathologic specimen looks like, compare that to the MRI as a step towards perhaps down the road offering it as an alternative. But it's early going for primary cancers of bone um, as opposed to, for example, the metastases where it's an, an established uh, treatment. Another question has come in through the web. It's for Dr. Elias, and it is how long will it take to have enough ta data to determine the long-term effects of focused ultrasound for the essential tremor patients? Well, um, that's a good question. You know, we, the clinical trial that we just completed at uh, eight centers around the world was a, a study with one-year follow-up. Um, of course, people are interested in, in much longer-term follow-up, and so the, the, the trial has an extension phase where patients are being followed annually for five years, so uh, we hope that we'll be able to extend uh, kind of our knowledge of this current study uh, to out to five years. Uh, that's the, that's the short-term answer, um, but uh, we're interested in, always in any particular surgical procedure uh, or treatment uh, about the longest term effects that we can actually measure. So we'll always want longer follow-up. There's another question that's come in. It is for all the panelists. Um, it's a, a little bit of a story question, but uh, the person writes, their son was diagnosed with mucosal melanoma in 2000 had surgical removal at that time, a relapse in 2005 that was treated with radiation, another relapse 10 years later in 2015. He was put on Keytruda and just was not able to tolerate the side effects of that medication. They did surgery in 2015. They were not able to get a two centimeter margin and that's why they chose that drug. Would focused ultrasound help him the cancers have been in his mouth and sinus areas. Thank you. I'll take a first shot at that. Um, it, uh, you know, certainly this is an un unfortunate situation. Uh, this melano melanomas are very aggressive and can recur after a long period of remission. Um, the current location of this particular patient's tumor would probably make it very difficult to treat using fo focused ultrasound mainly because of access issues. One of the things with ultrasound is that you do need to have what we call an acoustic window. Um, ultrasound requires uh, a medium to travel that is not air. Um, bone is an, an issue, but you know we, we can get some penetration through bone uh, as described uh, by the uh, neurologic studies, but uh, it, it, any type of um, bone air interface uh, is quite difficult. There are some, you know, there was a report today uh, looking at trying to treat lung, which is essentially just a bag of air and fluid fill that. So there are some potential techniques that might come up that would allow treatment, but uh, at, this, at this time and date, I would say that that would be a very difficult target for a focused ultrasound. The next question that has come in, has this therapy ever been tried on plexiform neurofibromas? Um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been used there. I've had a few patients contact me to ask about um, the use for, to treating NF. Um, and the location of their lesions thus far has pr precluded a, a safe treatment. 
Um, but it, it basically comes down, to, like any other soft tissue tumor, it comes down to location. Uh, proximity to skin, proximity to structures like nerves can limit the treatment. Um, and uh, plexiform neurofibromas can behave fairly aggressively, obviously, and uh, they, they typically are, are treated, uh, as a result of that, are, are treated more aggressively. But it would come down to the location of the individual's tumor. And this is possibly related, but another question um, for you, Dr. Ganuni, is has any research been done with the benign tumor syndrome neurofibromatosis? Just basically a follow-up to the same thing. Yeah, I've, I've looked at a few patients who, where they've sent, uh, where their doctors have sent me their imaging, uh, and again, thus far, we haven't been able to uh, find tumors that are amenable. Usually, these neurofibromas occur very close to the skin, uh, and uh, the risk would be of, of um, damaging the skin because of that proximity. We need to maintain a certain margin uh, to safely treat the tumor without damaging the structures around it. So thus far, I haven't seen a case that I can safely treat with the uh, the current embodiment of the technology. One could imagine different frequencies and future technologies, skin cooling techniques, things like that, that might uh, make this more amenable to those types of tumors. But at this point, uh, I haven't seen the tumor that's ideal for this. And for Dr. Huang, one additional. How close are we to uh, clinical trials for focused ultrasound with immunotherapy? Uh. For the specific uh, indication of looking at immunotherapy regimens, I think what we're still a ways away. I think that there are uh, still too many unknowns and no specific mechanisms that we can uh, point to. You know, having said that, I think we're going to see more and more cases come up uh, where we see this abscopal effect that uh, Dr. Orsi reported during this meeting. Uh, and in this process, uh, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do for pancreatic cancer is establish a registry uh, so we can obtain data and potentially get some immune markers to help narrow down the hypothesis as to why um, certain tumors and you know, why pancreatic cancer may or may not uh, have a, an immune response to high food therapy. So, specifically aimed at getting an immune response there this is the distant horizon we're really hoping that the cancer moonshot initiative will help fund some of this research i think that that's one of the reasons for you know uh, trying to increase awareness haifu is probably one of the the leading technologies that can harness the immune response it's very unique in terms of it being non-invasive and being able to elicit a mechanical tissue disruption so I think we have a lot of promise but uh, a lot of research is still needed before we can translate it clinically I would just add to that that uh, with uh, regard to blood brain barrier opening to follow up on some of what dr. Fishman said um, the technology is still being developed and explored in humans, but we're at the point where the, the trials in humans are being considered and designed, and one of the options being considered is the delivery of uh, immunoagents uh, through the brain, through the BBB, to target tumors within the brain. And there has been a follow-up online to the previous question about the neurofibromatosis, and they're just saying, what if it's not close to the skin? Would the problem be, uh, would there be a problem if it were close to the acoustic nerve? Uh, any nerve that's uh, involved by the tumor, whether it's encased or arising from the nerve, uh, would, would potentially be damaged by the thermal, uh, he by the heating process. So when we treat soft tissue tumors, we like to maintain a certain distance from the nerves uh, in order to try and preserve function. There's also an issue with accessibility, as Dr. Wang was talking about earlier. Uh, areas in the head and neck are, are a challenge uh, for current embodiments of the technology. There, there are um, devices being designed for the neck that are being investigated right now for the thyroid to begin with, but could potentially move into the neck region. And, um, but again, early going for that, uh, for that approach. Dr. Foley, I think that ends the questions from the web. Okay, thank you all so much, and um, we'll be getting a lot more information out to you in the future, I'm sure, so stay tuned.